that's first AI, and and that's you know that's the key. That's the key is for uh, for everyone to be thinking about that, getting the fertility as high as you can for first AI, and to do that, you've got to use these programs. Um, and then, then you can get a, a really a much higher percent pregnant before, let's say, before 130 or 150 days in milk. The higher percent we get pregnant before that, before that point, before that cutoff, the um, greater percentage of cows we have calving in without a lot of, of, of body condition loss after calving. The body condition loss after calving is creating lots of issues. Hello and welcome to the Dairy Black Belt Podcast. I'm Mark Thomas from Dairy Health, uh, and it's great to uh, have you here today, Dr. Richard Persley from Michigan State University. Good morning. Good morning, Mark. Dr. Richard Persley is one of the co-founders of the Officing Program. The, the Michigan State crew is widely recognized for their uh, role in, in area of reproduction. Uh, in dairy cattle, and, and especially some of the synchroniza synchronization programs, uh, publications of the high fertility cycle, and so forth. So, Richard, can you give us a little background of um, you, how you got to where you are today? Oh, you bet, Mark. Yeah, a long time ago, when I first got out of college, I actually dairy farm for about 12 years. My wife and I did. Um, we uh, decided to, to sell the cows uh, as about 1990. And I uh, went back to school, uh, did a master's degree at Jeff Stevenson at Kansas State University, and then ended up doing a Ph.D. with Milo Wiltbank at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, since graduating uh, there, and that was uh, with Milo. That's when we developed uh, the Offsync pro program. That was the, my, that was basically my dissertation was the development of, of that. Uh, since then, I've been at Michigan State almost 30 years. It'll be 30 years uh, in uh, coming up this next January, actually. So I've been here primarily working on uh, in an extension uh, research program. Uh, most of, of, of my extension and research uh, is the development of, of practical applications uh, that producers can utilize uh, to improve reproduction and improve profitability on their farms. And I, I think that's something that's really noted is the, uh, you know, not only the, the number of pu publications that have come from um, you and your group, but also the the practicality of those that, you know, things that can be implemented on the dairy and, and, uh, and used. Uh, so, and, and really translated for around the world. Yeah, that, that was our goal. And, and it still is our goal to, to, to try to improve those. We're doing a little bit more what we would call uh, on our end. I'm, I'm not a basic scientist, but a little more basic work dealing with pregnancy loss now, but, but that's, that's intended to try to help us understand pregnancy loss and try to, figure out ways to improve our, our programs uh, to increase uh, fertility of these cows. Talked about some of the work you're doing with early embryonic loss. Can you tell us uh, uh, what approach you're taking and, and some of the data you're gathering? Sure. For the last uh, six, seven years, we've been working on a way to uh, to determine losses in a, in a little different way. Uh, so we've taken the bioprint assay, uh, which no normally people will take blood samples, one blood sample around date 30, 32, 33, whatever it is, uh, to determine pregnancy. And we've taken it uh, basically and utilized daily blood samples to determine when those, um, in this case, it's pregnancy-specific pregnancy protein B, but it's a, it's a PAG, it's a pregnancy-associated glycoprotein, when that protein comes up in circulation. So if we take daily samples starting around day 17 or 18 all the way through day 26, we can uh, gain an uh, understanding of when those uh, when the uh, the conceptus attaches to, uh, to the uterus. And uh, in, in our all of the data we've got uh, so far, which is quite a bit, actually, number of studies, the, uh, the conceptus begins attaching around day 19, 20, mostly around day 20. And cows that attach around day 20, 21 have the lowest chance of having a pregnancy loss. If they attach two days later, day 22 or greater, they have a really high chance of pregnancy loss. So uh, that's interesting within itself. You know, what's going on there? We're not quite sure. Uh, but we've done a number of studies uh, to try to figure out, you know, what factors might affect timing of attachment and the percent that actually attach. And so we've done studies such as 
uh, uh, trying to increase progesterone post AI that actually had a negative impact on the percent that had conceptus attachment uh, when we tried doing that. And, and uh, so uh, at least right now, our belief is that the amount of progesterone that's there post AI is not as important as just having progesterone there from a, 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 a good CL. So we're, we're, we've, we've stopped going down that particular road. Uh, but we're doing other things, for example, uh, trying to figure out follicle size that's ovulating. Um, you know, is it affecting uh, concepts attachment? Uh, not so much, but it really affects actually uh, the percent that lose pregnancies, amazingly enough. So there's something going. We think there's something more going on with with the egg that's housed inside that follicle that ovulates uh, the oocyte, the egg that's being fertilized. Uh, that's that's probably got some issues that's that's creating an embryo that at some point uh, is not going to develop fully. It's going to die. And and then there are also other uh, things that we've seen that that appear that that um, um, it could, you know, it could be a, a uterine effect also. So so we've been doing a number of studies to try to try to figure this out. Uh, it's going to take us even a little while long, longer, I think, to do that. Uh, but um, finding out that we're, we're getting some pretty interesting data. That being said, we've actually gone back to day 14 and we're, we're taking um, actually intercervical samples of uh, swabs to determine uh, levels of, of um, uh, a, uh, the upregulation of a, of a gene uh, that, uh, that is upregulated when there's interferon tau there. So if there's interferon tau there, there's an embryo there. So uh, embryo, the elongated embryo is producing interferon tau. It upregulates this gene, ISG15. And so we've been taking these uh, samples uh, to determine, you know, what percent of cows actually have this upregulation, what percent are, are actually pregnant at day, at day uh, 14. And we're getting a really high percent that are pregnant at that time. And it's, it's actually over 90 percent. And so we're getting a lot of, it looks like we're getting a lot of pregnancies uh, in our cows, at least here in, in, in Michigan, where we don't have the heat stress uh, that, that maybe some other people have in different, different areas. And I, I'm sure that would, would, would uh, have different effects uh, on, on the growth of the embryo. But, but at least here, we're seeing that most cows are pregnant, but we're, but best case scenario, first lactation cows, we're getting about 65, 70% that have conceptus attachment. Multiparous cows are getting about 55, 60% that have conceptus attachment. But then from that point on, we're getting, we're getting um, a lot more losses, especially in multiparous cows. But we're getting a lot of cows pregnant. So why are we getting, you know, why aren't those cows having conceptus attachment uh, when it looks like they've got an elongated embryo growing there and it just doesn't? Uh, just doesn't uh, get to the point where it attaches to the uterus. So the, those are the questions for us. And, and if we develop some practical ways to try to test that, maybe we can figure out uh, 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 some of the problems that, that we, could, we could tweak uh, whatever program uh, that's, that's out there right now, such as double offsync, uh, we could tweak those to make those a little bit better. That's really interesting. And, and I think, you know, for, um, the practicality side is that what we do to achieve conception works. If you say ninety percent, it's it's then what happens after conception that uh, where we probably have more of the opportunity as we look to future opportunities. Correct? Yeah, it, it certainly looks that way. And you know, of course, this uh, this that particular study we used double op sync, and so um, we didn't have another. Uh, 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 like we didn't have an estrus control for that when it was uh, all these cows received double offsync, but, but, um, uh, yeah, it's looking like, uh, uh, but with double offsync, we don't get everything pregnant, right? If, if everybody would be happy if we can get 50, 50% of our cows pregnant with double offsync. And, and a lot of people do that, you know, our multiparous cows are the, probably the biggest issue. They, they don't quite reach that level. Uh, but, we, you know, those are the cows that we really need to focus on to try to increase fertility. Those cows keep them in the herd longer, right? So, I mean, uh, they're what we call now, they're our cash cows. To, it takes a long time to pay off a first lactation animal, uh, it probably into the second lactation. And uh, so we need to keep those multiparous cows as, uh, around as long as we can, keep them healthy. You know, that's the key, right? No, exactly. And, and I think that's a, a nice segue, Richard, into 
uh, as we caught up beforehand, uh, estrus versus Avsync, double Avsync uh, trial. Just some comments there that you know we we know that double Avsync is not just a synchronization program; it's also a uh, fertility improvement program. But uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, we finished about a year and a half ago or so. We finished a big trial, um, uh, getting close to two years ago actually now, at uh, at a large farm north of town. And uh, uh, just comparing uh, first, uh, first service uh, uh, conception rates uh, to an estrus that was determined by um, um, activity monitors and uh, compared with double off sync. And uh, double off sync was around 52-ish percent uh, conception rates. The estrus detection uh, conception rates were around 35% thereabouts. So about a 50, if you think about it, it's about a 50% increase. So if you take 50% times 35, add it to, to 35, you're going to get about 50 some odd percent. So uh, a big increase in fertility in, in, in that case. It's this, it's, you know, it's not the first study that's shown that though, Mark, there's a number of studies already out there show the same thing. Uh, we actually published uh, some data last year uh, showing the same thing when we compared estrus to a pre-sync um, leaven off sync. So you cherry pick or you don't cherry pick off of a, uh, off uh, two prostaglandins before uh, off sync. Uh, in this case, it was 11 days from the second PG to the start of off sync. Uh, Dr. Fricky's done them where they're 12 days. He gets the same uh, out outcomes that we get, or we get the same outcomes that he got. Uh, and, um, and 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 in, in those studies, uh, we all always have for time day I, uh, we always have a, a greater percent of cows pregnant than compared to an asterisk. So we're so basically we're improving the fertility of, of these cows uh, using these time these really good time day I programs uh, that really synchronize ovulation really well. And that would be double off sync would be the best. Uh, G six G would 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 be right in there pretty close. And then pre-sync 11 off sync uh, works really well. Um, uh, but you've got to take all cows uh, all the way through. You've got, if they come into estrus, you've got to ignore them, uh, take them all the way through for a timed AI. Because if you do, uh, if you cherry pick and then you follow uh, with with the uh, timed AI, you're still going to be in the 35% range and, and thereabouts. First lactation animals a little better than that. Multiparous cows a little worse than that. And so, so um, we, in, in the study we published last year, the, the estrus uh, cows uh, that were first lactation did pretty well. They were 45 percent. But, but if you look at the also, if you look at the study we just did where we compared estrus to double off sync, even the uh, estrus um, uh, cows bred to, uh, following an estrus um, uh, weren't nearly as good. The first lactation cows weren't nearly as good as the double off sync cows. It, it was still a wide margin uh, in favor of double off sync in those cows. So you can really get uh, fertility up in those first lactation cows uh, with double off sync, uh, even though, you know, we would consider uh, the, uh, the outcomes to bring to an estrus to those not being too bad, actually, but, but you still get a big improvement. So that's first AI, and and that's you know that's the key. That's the key is for uh, for everyone to be thinking about that, getting the fertility as high as you can for first AI, and to do that, you've got to use these programs. Um, and then then you can get a, a really a much higher percent pregnant before let's say before 130 or 150 days in milk. The higher percent we get pregnant before that before that point before that cutoff. The um, greater percentage of cows we have calving in without a lot of, of, of body condition loss after calving. The body condition loss after calving is creating lots of issues. Um, it's it's um, uh, associated uh, with a, a lot of metabolic problems. And then once you get, uh, once again, later in lactation and you're inseminating those cows for the first time, they have a lower chance of becoming pregnant. That's what we call the high fertility cycle. So it's really critical to get as high a percent pregnant as possible to avoid all those problems in the next calving. And to do that, you've got to consider using a, a, a high fertility program uh, to, to get those done. And then once you've got the first AI in, um, I'm all in on on the activity monitors after that. As soon as we can catch those non-pregnant cows back in estrus, back in heat, um, uh, the better. And because and, we really don't get uh, much of a, of a boost at all uh, when you 
uh, for a second AI on uh, breeding to an asterisk or, or a resync program. There isn't much difference. So, so the sooner you can get them pregnant, the better in that case. But you also need to back all that up with a, with a, a resync to make sure that those cows do get an insemination at some point, you know, after, after a preg- pregnancy diagnosis of, of not pregnant. So for our listeners, there you go, because <clears throat> how many times do you get asked, what is the best synchronization program? What should I do? And, th- and there's your, there's your, uh, your answer. <laughs> Richard, uh, a, a pleasure to catch up this morning. Um, some great information. We'll, we'll tell our listeners, stay tuned to uh, Journal Dairy Science, uh, Hordes, etc., where, where lots of these things uh, end up getting, getting published. And uh, we'll look forward to continued research from you and your group. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to, to sit here and, and visit with you, Mark. Was, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. So as we sign off here from the Dairy Black Belt podcast, uh, Mark Thomas, have a great day.